We talked last week a little bit about the process of, of, of painting. And I'm glad you're back because this pertains a little bit to your painting today, just a little. Not that I'm going to shine you out, but we, we talked a little bit about the process of painting and the way that I paint. And this is, again, this is the way that I paint. It's not the way that everybody paints. But what I find best when you start off on a white canvas is to lay the painting in as quick as possible. So last week we saw Judy do that. She laid the whole painting in as quick as she could. And uh, for Judy, that might take a little bit of time because she's a little bit of a tight painter. And so she kind of worked her way through but got the canvas covered. It was somewhat monochromatic, okay? So she came in today and she started in really muling over this wall back here. And if you can imagine, this painting was just, you know, without all this in here. She was just like saying, oh, you know, I can't get the texture of the wall and I want to do detail. And I said, well, where's your central focal point? And she goes, well, it's kind of here, but let's talk about the wall. And I go, but Judy, where's your central focal point? And she goes, Let, no, let's not talk about that. Let's go. It was like this little, a little bit of this arm wrestle with her this morning. And so I said, Judy, I said, you know, if you really establish your central focal point, you don't need to worry about the wall anymore. You don't need to really worry. They will kind of, you'll figure that out later on. And we had the same issue with Jean today. He said, you know, she was starting a painting and she's working from a photograph. Did you take the photograph? Okay, so what was the source off of the computer? Or? A magazine. A magazine. So she's working off of a magazine photograph. And it's a photograph of Mount Zion, midday, typical, fall scenes, beautiful. Zion is like Yosemite in red. So, I mean, you have to really be a corpse not to come up with really beautiful photographs in Zion, especially in fall. And so these are really beautiful photographs, but it's midday. And so she's working and she's working on trying to get the, the cliff and stuff. And I'm like, where's your central focal point? And the whole painting's covered and she's doing just what I always request. Cover that damn canvas. Get rid of that white canvas. Give me an idea of what your idea is. And so when that's all laid in at that point, then you go in with your central focal point. And I kept on saying, where's your central focal point? She goes, I don't know, I haven't thought about it. And I said, well, isn't this kind of where you want to go? And she's like, hmm. I go, come on. You know, so I grabbed a bunch of paints with my fingers and I said, right here, this is what you want. And I just smeared the paint right across her. I mean, and she was like, ah. <laughs> I said, that's how you, that's how you determine determine your central focal point. And why is that a central focal point? Because I chose it. With, with Judy's painting, I chose it. At that point I said, that's my central focal point. She doesn't have to go with it. And Judy could have said, well, I don't like that. Anyway, so you have to determine your central focal point at the beginning of the painting. You should have an idea for your central focal point before you even start. I mean, that's in that initial phase. Yeah, but the sketch has to have it. It's, it's like the sketch has to have it. When you're outdoors painting, there's a moment when you're painting that it's like, oh, I like that. You need to get that in as fast as you can because you can always work backwards. Plus, when that central focal point in, is in, it changes your relationship to that canvas. And so in this particular instance, this was out. She was, she was here and I kept on coming back and say, where's your central focal point? She gave me five or six things. And I said, here, let me sit down for a second, show you what a central focal point looks like. So I came in and I brought the, the light in there. It's not on any of her pictures. It's not on any subject matter that she has. And she's like flipping through going like, where do you get that? And it's like, no, I'm just choosing what my central focal point is. And what I'm choosing is that the light is at about 11 o'clock coming through and the wall is just conveniently at that point where no light's hitting it. Maybe little bits of the stonework might be catching little bits of light, but coming down to the, here, I lightened that whole wall. And I said, that's what a central focal point looks like. And I put in this bright light over here and went off there, uh, went and illuminated over to the side of the painting, trying to fill up that. So it looked like a beam of light illuminating. Okay. Once we got that in, the conversation was no more about this wall back here anymore. And we started talking about what kind of light would this be? And you know, just how saturated. And I always think a painting is best when it's 90% shadow, 
10% light. In fact, I would even say 95% or 98% shadow and just a smidgen of light. So shadows are the most important. So automatically this whole painting became shadow and then we have this wonderful lighting effect that, that um, is hitting this doorway. It just so happens to be hitting the, the walkway there. Just so happens to hit a few of the, the stones that are sticking out from the wall for the doorway. The pot sitting on top of the, the railing here. The light coming down on the railing. Not all the way, just right here. Uh, it, it's hitting the rails on the outside of the window frames there. Um, and so I'm, I'm ideally putting in a light that I want to put in. Um, it may never occur there. You know, there might be something here that's blocking it that never allows that kind of light, but I don't know. But that's part of being an artist. An artist creates. In fact, even when we talk about photography, you know how I say that photography isn't art? John said a real poignant thing. He says, well, you take a picture and you create a painting. You don't create a picture. You take a picture, okay? So that's really in a nutshell. You take a picture, but you create a painting. Now you can take a picture and then manipulate it. But in painting, we create from the beginning, from an idea, from nothing. See, the picture, if you take a picture, you've got to have something happen for you to take a picture. You know, they're at least halfway done. We have nothing. We go out there with skill and have no mechanical device to capture anything. We have a white canvas and a brush and a tube of paint. Mm -hmm. And then we have to make it up. But that's the beauty of oil painting is that we get to make it up. And so I made up a story here and now that's the story. Now she has to consistently um, tell what that story would be and that story would be the light hitting a central focal point like that and once the light comes into a dark space like that it reflects and everything in this painting is going to be influenced by the reflection of that light. Now if she spent all <coughs> month painting all of these wonderful features she has in this drawing without knowing that she was going to have this light in here because she knew it in the future that's what she's going to do. She wouldn't have put in the lighting effects that all this uh, would cause. So like this light hitting this wall would cast a reflection onto this wall. And that reflection would be so bright that even these elements that are blocking the reflection would have cast shadows. So she's going to have cast shadows going the other direction because of the light coming this direction. Mm -hmm. And so everything she's going to do from here on out is affected by this central focal point. And you can see why it's important to get your central focal point in first. And to get it in to the intensity that you want. Because as she's going in painting all of these things, she has to make sure that nothing in this painting overpowers the focal point. So every decision she's going to have to make is going to rely on the central focal point. That's why it's important to get into the central focal point and put in the intensity, put in the color, put in what you want to say at the very beginning because it affects everything. It's the same way as somebody's doing a, a tiger in the other room. And the first thing she did was lay in all of the, the central focal, you know, all of the, the canvas with the tiger and the grass and all what the painting's supposed to be. And then she remembered that the central focal point when you're dealing with animals and people are always eyes. So she's remembered that and she says, well, she started putting in the eyes. And then she went and started working on the ears. And I go, no, 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 no. You start with the eyes and then you work with the hair around the eyes and then you work around that like a goggles and you work out from there. Why? Because if she puts in the ears now and, and paints them in, they might be too detailed. Remember, the only thing that you see in focus is the thing you want to show the viewer. So in this particular painting, this is what needs to be in focus. All of this over here 
is going to be out of focus. And when she's painting that, she needs to be aware of that because as she's starting to illustrate all of these, these subject matters that are getting the reflective light in here and start to emphasize more of the edges over on this side, she's going to have a tendency to put hard edges on it. And that's going to start pulling away from the central focal point. The only hard edges in this whole painting should be in that area. So it's really crucial to put that in. So like in your painting, I had to drastically take a bunch of paint with my fingers and smear it on saying, that's what is an idea for the central focal point is. Because once you have that in, then everything else is going to have to work with that. And you might find out that you were starting with the trees and the fall colors and putting in detail over there. That might have been too much detail at this point. You might put that in and decide, I like the softness to that. But if you don't put in the central focal point first, you'll have a tendency to overwork everything else. People who do portraits, oftentimes they'll say the last thing you paint is the, the eyes. So you end up looking at this portrait for weeks. With no eyes? With no eyes. And they say, save the eyes for last. And I'm like going, oh, first it's very unfriendly to sit in front of this for, you know, so, and then when they get around putting in the eyes, they've overworked everything else. They've spent time because your eyes are not focusing on the eyes of the, the portrait. And so they're putting in all of the hair and all of the, the detail, the dress, all this stuff that's really so non important in a portrait painting. You go in and paint the eyes and then you work out from there. And you might get to halfway through with just this and go, that's it. I don't need any more. I don't need to put all that detail around. So your paintings look a little looser. And a lot of people say, I want my paintings to look looser. And I go, well, they're not going to be looser if you work backwards and work from the top down. Because you're finishing things as you go along. Part of that looseness is the unfinished part. Well, how do you know when something is finished? Is you work it to death. Usually you overfinish it and you go, whoops, I went too far. Remember, uh, Churchill said, it takes two artists to paint a painting, one to paint it and the other one to hit them over the head telling them you're done, <laughs> right? But the problem is you need a full-time artist all the time over your shoulder. So, um, so you want to be sure that you get the central focal point in, get the detail in, get the focus in, and, and then work out from there. And you'll find out that maybe a lot of the preliminary beginnings of the painting that you put in, that you should get in the at the first 5, 10, 15 minutes of the painting might be the looseness that you're looking for in a painting. So you might not have to finish the rest of it. And you'll see a lot of these really great portraits in the museum. You'll see these wonderful portraits where they're done, you know, they're, the head's done and everything, and the rest of the painting is, almost looks like it's half done. There's one of Washington you, that doesn't have. And then if that's all in, why do you need anything else? We know it's Washington, you know? So, so you paint that first. So anyway, you're on a really great start right here. So it's so like I see awesome. and they, since you put the light, I now think that she has middle tones but not dark tones. We yeah. Kind of so these all become middle tones and dark, although she needs to get a little bit brighter middle tones because this much light in that tiny little space would illuminate more. But there's going to be an, another challenge is because underneath the staircase is darker shadow. Yeah. You're going to have darker shadow underneath the stairway because it's not getting this light or this light. And so the whole thing becomes now how the lights work in your painting as opposed to what the subject looks like. And see, for years you're, you've been painting uh, with stuff. You've been painting the wall and the... And, the, the vases and the flowers and the things you've been painting, the, those things. And you've done really, really well. But now, in this method, you're painting the light. You're working light. And so now it's like, where's the shadows? Where's the highlights? Where's the reflective lights? And you're thinking lights as opposed to, oh, how do I paint the brick underneath the bridge? And, you know, all of these other things. So you're just kind of in a different mindset. But it's, it's growth. This is going to be a challenge. It's going to be awesome. But now, you say she can play with the light on the left-hand side of her canvas, but how does one attain that and not fight your focal? Well, that's just it. Is it, is it, with, is it with... You put it on, you step back, and you go, oh, no, that's fighting with that color. Yeah. And then you dab it off. Mm -hmm. With your finger. I do it with my finger. <laughs> uh, 
I gave, I gave a long talk up and you know, it was raining at my workshop. And so I was telling them some of my tricks, some of my secrets. We were talking about uh, uh, this stuff that I do and we were talking about paints being poisonous. And so we were, we were discussing, you know, really how, how uh, poisonous are paint products and as opposed to not worrying about them. And I was telling them that usually the leads that are in, in, in chemicals that are in paint are not very absorbent through your hands. And so I have a lot of students that come in and they paint with gloves on because they're concerned. Mm -hmm. Some are. Some of them have very expensive manicures. And so they want to protect them. But um, one of my most favorite things in the world is to use my hands. And if you have rubber gloves on, you can't get that wonderful smudge that you can get when you are, when you are painting with your fingers. You can't pick up paint with your finger. You know? And I love that, I love that um, effect. So like if I paint something in, and we were just talking about it, if I paint something in and it's too bright, all I do is take my thumb and put it right on top and lift it. And sometimes it lifts just enough paint, enough paint gets into my fingerprint that it picks up just enough paint to soften the effect ever so much. Oftentimes I'll put some trees in the background mountains and it's just a little too bright in value. And I'll put my thumb right on it. You can actually see my fingerprint on the painting and you'll actually see, and that tree will go from um, really intense to a softer value without having to repaint it. So I get a lot of that and I do a lot of schmearing mm -hmm. with my pinkies and you know things so I really get in there and you can't get those effects with gloves on. You know so and I don't know anybody that's really ever died of paint poisoning. In fact Michelangelo and Leonardo <laughs> da Vinci they worked with this stuff raw and breathing it and they lived longer than anyone else at that period of time. Their mind was great. <laughs> <laughs> the leads are only poisonous to children. As you develop as an older person, the leads that are you get in your paints are not, 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 not for adults. It's for children that the lead problems are, and chewing on banisters. And the thing is, the whole thing of that is, is lead on banisters, lead on windowsills, because kids that are not behaved, they're like horses left in a barn. You know, if you're not paying attention to your children, or if you don't pay attention to your horses, they start chewing on things because they're bored. And so, you know, a kid that chews on a banister is, I would worry more about the boredom that they have, and maybe you're not being a good parent, more than the fact that, you know, they're getting lead poisoning. But anyway, that's why they stopped all the lead scares and stuff. That's why, you know, Prop 65 and stuff is out there for them. But I digress. Anyway, so, uh, so what will happen is that she'll put in some highlights over there, and then she may have to play them down a little bit if they compete. But she would have no way to gauge if she didn't have the highlight in there, how light she needs to go to make them work. Yeah. So at least now she has a, a goal. Okay. So at this point it's like you put some paint on and you remember what artists do. And see most of you sit down and paint and I do that too because it's more comfortable. But what artists do is that they come up, they'll look at something and then they'll and they'll step back like this. And then they'll come back. Because they're always comparing. And so you don't really compare a painting three feet in front. Sargent used to paint this way. I don't have a long enough room to show you how Sargent painted. Sargent had a 24 foot room and he would stand, the model would be over where you are, Gene, and he would stand here, and his table would be out here, even further than this. So the table would be much further away from, from his painting, and he would mix his colors way out here, but actually much further. And he would sit and look at the model, and he would make a choice, what he was going to work on, and then he would mix that color. And a lot of people think Sargent painted very fast, but he didn't. It drove his clients crazy. And he would sit there and he would look at the model for a while and mix his paints. And then from across the room he would look at his painting and go back and forth and he'd come over 
and he'd walk across the room, sometimes 24 feet. And he always had a cigar in one hand. And he always had like Persian, he had a Persian rug in his studio. And there was a, in, a burn mark for all of his ashes on one side and then a, a, a runway in his Persian rug of where he'd go back and forth. So he would, he would come up, his cigar would be here, he'd come up and like a swordsman he'd look back and forth and he'd come over and go. And then he'd step back. And then he'd see whether or not the effect that he just did looked like the effect because you're not sitting so close to me either. And so what happens is that he would see whether or not what he just did matched what he saw. And if not, he would go over and, and then step back. He didn't quite do that. But it landed on its... Um, so anyway, that's, that's how he would work. So, so you know, he, they always have the, the whole picture in mind when they are creating. And so if you have the luxury of having a studio that's big like that, mm -hmm. put your tabaret, your, your table that you are painting on, put it four or five feet away. And then look at your model even further away from that. And you can do that even with your studio still lives. You know, so it's just an idea, you know. Maybe we just take painting too casual by just relaxing and painting. So anyway, that's how you would compare your painting to make sure that what you put on doesn't compete to your central focal point. It's just what you're willing to do to get your painting, but you don't have to get that drastic. I mean, you know, also Sargent worked on huge canvases, so his models were almost always life-size. You know, so they, he would have a life-size model sitting on a huge canvas with all the backgrounds and stuff. So you can imagine. Um, so anyway, you're underway on this. Does it make sense to you now? Huge difference. Yeah. What's awesome about teaching is when, you know, you've been in my classes a long time. But what's awesome is that moment when you have breakthroughs. You know, and we have small breakthroughs all the time with, with Sue, but then every once in a while you're like sitting there going, are you kidding me? And it's like, yeah, and the thing is, I, you know, we were talking about this earlier. We were sitting there, you know, I've been teaching for 35 years. It isn't until I started handing out homework to students and working with this in this capacity that I honed down my, my, my skills to to, to take what I know and encapsulize it into a um, idea. Okay, so like, you know, working with the central focal points, an idea, it's a concept, it's something that you're not gonna pick up a book and read. These are, these are things that I developed after teaching for so many years. I would teach, I'd take a class out onto the location and everybody would come back with muddled mud and I would go, what's going on here? And I'd go, okay, you know, is it a temperature thing? I didn't really know that. I didn't know, you know, so I was just having everybody copy paintings and do really well, but in the process I was developing, and remember when I was going to college, it was the era of modern art. So nobody was teaching anything. It was like, you know, put paint on your boobs and then rub it on your canvas and call it self-expression, right? You were in that school too. <laughs> And so there was, there was no teaching. I would sit there in, the, in this classroom and we had a model in front of us and I'd go, oh my God, her body is like porcelain. And I'd turn to the teacher and go, how do you paint that? And she would turn around and she would go, I don't know, I went to school in the 60s and we never learned how to paint anything. And she was the teacher of college teaching nothing again. You know, so I sat there in a dark room with this model in that class trying to figure out for myself, how do you get porcelain-like skin like that? I could paint ruddy old men, but when this beautiful model came in, I was like, I had to figure it out. Mm -hmm. Everything that I've learned, I've had to figure it out. And Judy, when she started with me, I thought that you first, you know, when I was teaching down here, that you would paint a tree with every leaf. And so we sat there painting leaves on trees for years. Mm -hmm. 
dot, 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 dot. And it's still good, it's still good. But the thing is, in the process, I was only 20 at the time. And so at the process, I was learning along with everything. Well, that, and, and the thing is, the need for my students, especially at that time, was to go home with pretty pictures. And that I could give them. And so, so they would come in, they would have a challenge. I would say, oh, well, that's a little black and that's a little this. Just go ahead and paint that. I didn't have a limited palette. I didn't have this. I didn't have anything. I was too green. And there wasn't any Richard Schmidt or there wasn't any internet that you could sit and get masters to t talk to. I grew up in Lake Tahoe. And then I came down to San Jose. And San Jose is not really a mecca of fine art. You know, it's not really. Where was it <laughs> No, we're talking 30 years ago. I mean, you know, it was a lot, a lot of cow towns out here. And so, so the, the thing is, it wasn't really, you know, nobody was really developing that way. And so I was, and I would go talk to art groups. And I'd say, how many of you are oil painters? And nobody was. Everybody's doing watercolors and pastels. That was the big thing. So, and then I would go in with realistic landscape painting. And they were like, and so I would make some fancy things up so that they would be entertained because nobody really cared about oil painting at the time. Things have changed and we have gotten really to the point where quality of art is huge. But the thing is there's still stuff that's not being taught that I've learned backwards by having to see how did they think back then. And one of these is, you know, this method of painting and putting in the bright. Now the thing is I started learning and doing this and teaching it to my students 10 years ago. Okay. But even then, I've had students that have been really comfortable with the way that they've been painting for years. And it was really hard for people to come, to come in. And I admire my students that have come in. I admire the students that actually do the homework assignments. Because here they come into a situation where they're painting from life, which a lot of them weren't. And they had to learn that process or go out and paint outdoors. Look, my students finally are forming a group to go out and paint outdoors. And they're finding it's not easy. It is not. It is not easy. It's fun. Yeah, yeah and you always have lunch at the time. But, you know, lunch. but the thing is, it's nice to have that kind of thing. So they're just now discovering plein air painting. And my God, I've been teaching plein air painting. You, we went to Yosemite back in 82 or 83. <laughs> In, in between 82 and 85. Yeah, so we were going to Yosemite, Grand Canyon, Yellowstone. We were doing this before the word plein air painting was even out there. You know, I sat there in a bar in, in Fremont, on Fremont Street, uh, with, with Eric, the publisher of, of Plain Air Magazine, discussing whether or not it was a good idea to use the word plein air on a magazine because you'd have to educate people on what plein air painting was. And I go, well, no, I'm going to go with outdoor painting because that's what we do. I don't feel like I need to like, go through all of that. But he decided to go with the plain air thing, which was good because it caught on and everybody's now it's a, it's a word that people use. But the thing is, when I was starting, it was outdoor painting. And it was so natural because that's what I did when I was in Tahoe. So it was just something I did for years and years and years. But then it was my challenge to really fill up this hour with really poignant ideas and, and inspirations so that if you weren't here, you'd miss some things, mm -hmm. you know? And so, you know, over a course of time, and, and I was so desperate, I started the Power to Create class where I said, I'm just gonna start my own class. <laughs> you know, I'll start a different class. Nobody's gonna paint in that class. So we did the Power to Create class. So it was a three hour lecture class. And th those classes were full, and I still have people asking to do that. So I think the knowledge, and people like to do that, it's, it's a really difficult class to go through. But the thing is, I started integrating that into this. And some people would say, well, I did the Power to Create class, and what you do in there is redundant. And I'm like going, how can it be redundant? Everything is new. Not only that, every time I give a talk, every time I come up with an idea, I try to spurt it into this class. And then when we have a breakthrough like this, it's like, hey, look. And it's like, I don't know where, when it comes. And I have students that will sit there for years. And they're like, oh, you never said anything like that. And I go, yeah, I have. You just haven't been in a place to understand what I was trying to say. You know, so I don't, I don't fault them at all either. It's, it's, you know, for 20 years they heard me kind of say, oh, well, just paint a little blue, paint this, you're doing nice, all that stuff. And I'm like, now it's like, 
okay, you're my disciples. You need to go out there. When people go, who do you take lessons from? I want them to go, oh my God, mm -hmm. your work is gorgeous. He must be a good teacher because I have that kind of ego. <laughs> I, got, I got to make sure that I am the best art teacher there is. So I work hard at that. But anyway, so that's, that's why it is. So it's not their fault. It's not my fault. It's whatever. Do you agree? It's a learning process. Yeah. And the thing is, you now it's like exciting. I mean, she's been taking lessons for years and all of a sudden she's like, oh, this is a whole new breath of fresh air. I'm going to see. So it's, for me, it's job security. Yeah. You know. Now you said that. I, I, what did she say? I said if we just paid attention the first time, we'd all be out of here. That's right. Well, the thing is... I, I'm seeing this, and I get it, whether I can do it or not, is something else, but I mean, you know, I get it. Yeah. Um, yeah. What, I, what I'm thinking, I've just wondered. Yeah, I just want, I wonder too. And I'm amazed too. I wonder why it took me 20 years of teaching until I finally figured out. It took me that long to even figure out, because I didn't have a mentor. I didn't have, you know, temperatures. Temperatures. Now, I never really made a big thing about temperatures, because I would... I, you know, and the thing is, it's like the foundation of my classes, okay? So that's really like, that's, that whole thing is, is about, you know, that's like the break, that's the thing that the old masters mm -hmm. understood. And I would sit there, I would sit there and go, oh, let me, and they, and what they would do is I would say, okay, this is what I've discovered. And they were so busy trying to, to interrupt the conversation about how did it apply to their painting right now because they were just focusing on getting a product done. And so it was really difficult for me. That's why I had to set time aside to, to, to do this separately. It's worked really good, you know. But, you know, the, the temperature conversation, it was like a, oh, are you kidding me? And it still is, are you kidding me? When students come into my class, they're like going, are you kidding me? And I go, yeah, that's the secret. Yeah, but you, you guys know what that is, so you know, we won't go into that conversation. But anyway, um, so that was a huge breakthrough. Center focal point was a huge breakthrough, mm -hmm. you know? And the thing is, for a lot of people, they still don't get it. The thing is, we're so, so programmed to copy paintings. Yeah. We're so programmed to copy a magazine or a photograph that to, to actually sit there and go, no, change it. I mean, like for Judy, Judy paints very realistic. And she relies on her, her, her research to give her the answers that she could put onto her painting. And here I'm like saying, give me all those pictures. Give me them all. Put them all aside. And let's choose a central focal point that's not on a picture. See, it's really hard today with you. It's like, choose a focal point. And you were like, uh, uh, uh. And I'm like going, well, no. But, but I said, this is what... But this is what, well, I have to. Uh, this is my drama. This is my, my exactly. this, I've got my light. This is your truth. Yeah, so I picked up some paint with my fingers and said, here. Yes, Okay, and then it was like, that's, your, that's how you choose a focal point. Okay. Okay, we chose this focal point. We didn't have to find a source. And so part of the issue is choosing beyond what's available to you and choose from your experiences. You know, all those times when you travel and you see something so extraordinary and you know it's just a fleeting moment. Th that point where you nudge your husband and go, look at that, and then it's gone. Those are the moments that you're trying to create. But it's at a certain point. Ensel Adams, and I told you this story, Ensel Adams is known for one of his most famous photography, uh, photographs, and I don't know what that is. Um, but it's a painting of a cemetery. It's a photograph of a cemetery. And he was driving through New Mexico and all of a sudden he saw the potential. He saw the potential. He saw what was going to happen. There was a moon, the sun was going down, and the cemetery's in back. And if you look for this, you'll find it because it's, he's considered, he considered it his masterpiece. 
he set up his camera, which was very cumbersome because it was the old fashioned kind with the big accordion thing. And so, and he clicked a picture immediately. And then he clicked the second one. And then the third one. And the only one that was worth anything was the first one. The second and third and fourth and fifth rendering of the same subject matter, the effect was gone. I even wonder what the effect was prior to him clicking. But literally, as quick as it took him to get a new slate in there and to photograph it, the effect was gone. So there's just moments at time. And that's what you want to paint in your paintings, are those moments where it's purely extraordinary, just like with Ansel Adams. That's what you want. Mm. Ordinary made extraordinary. Yeah. So is that art? That's, is it art? No, well, at first it takes an artist to catch it. It takes an artist to catch it. And a camera rendering it. I think so you take a picture of it, but does it require more skill to create that or take it? Remember, Ansel Adams took that picture. We would have to start from nothing to create it. <laughs>